Hello, I'm David Bianco. If this is your first time here, welcome. If you're returning, thanks for joining me again. Today we're going to be talking about how music is produced, the beginning of music. I know we've talked a lot about getting things to record and the mastering chain and all of that in the MoFi situation. It's time to move past that, unless there's something significant. Now it's time to talk about how music gets made. And there's various ways it gets made, but the fundamentals are always the same. The techniques have changed over time. So we're gonna focus on that next on The Sound of Safe and Sound, Texas. Hello again. So. What about music? How is it created? Well, there's a lot of different types of music. There's symphonic music, you know, classical music, there's country music, rock music, but the fundamentals, you know, they're, they're all basically the same. And that is an artist has to produce some kind of song, whether it's musically uh, an instrumental or it's vocals and instrumentals, whatever it might be. And so they go into a studio usually. Some albums are done very raw early Paul McCartney albums when he went solo he kind of just had a recorder a four track recorder and he, he did them on his own he even played all the instruments and then he mixed it together so it can be very unsophisticated to very sophisticated but of course in today's world we're into many many tracks of music and so how does that begin well an artist decides on songs to put on an album and they usually work with a producer uh, that will help them do that and also you know how are they going to present those songs uh, if they wrote them themselves of course they can just uh, decide how they're going to do it but sometimes you do a cover of something that's been done before written by somebody else uh, and maybe you're going to make it your own and make it a little bit different maybe speed it up a little use different instruments whatever and that's in the production and deciding how we're going to make the music but once the artist knows how they're going to make the music and they have maybe accompanying uh, artists with them or they have a band whatever it is uh, the instruments and the voices uh, come in through some sort of an electronic device, a microphone or a direct connection. And, and that goes into a soundboard and that soundboard can have any number of channels. Early uh, stereo was really, you know, four channel was kind of the where they would have four different inputs coming in and, and they would separate that way. That's why some of the really early stuff of the Beatles when it's in stereo it just sounds really awful. Uh, and it's only because sometimes there were just only four tracks and the voices were on a track or two, the drums and the two guitars. So you had very, you had limitations in terms of what all you could record, but then when it got mixed by the uh, mixing engineer, they would decide where the placement of that would be and how loud it would be. So that's when the mixing comes in. And the mixing is done typically on a multi-track, so it's taking all of these different tracks. And again, today, you know, you're into 16, 32, 64 channels and tracks that you can pull in. And, and obviously to modulate all that and to make it mixed into what you end up hearing in two tracks is the work of, of the engineer. Uh, and the artists involved to see what's going to sound predominant. Uh, is the guitar going to sound really predominant? In a solo, it probably is. In, in the rest of the song, it might be pushed back a little bit or lessened on the volume. Where is the placement going to be of the instruments? Are they going to be centered? Are they going to be, you know, 30 degrees out from center? Are they going to be as far out as the end? In other words, uh, that instrument is totally shut off from one channel and it sounds like it's over here or it's over here. So the engineer is determining all that in the multi-track. And the multi-track then usually then comes down to become the the two track final mix, so to speak, of left and right. If it's quadraphonic, it was four. If it's multi-channel, uh, like an SACD, uh, it can be more channels than that. You have your 5.1, which is uh, six channels, including the uh, subwoofer, or 7.1, which is uh, seven plus a subwoofer, or there's, I think, 9.2 now with two subwoofers in the front and the back. Oh, it's, but my point is, these are all the individual channels. So as you split these off more, you can hear more discrete sounds coming out of the various instruments. 
But when you're in a two-track stereo, those are kind of all blended together, and then they are volume controlled, and they are balance controlled as to which channel they go into. So when we end up with a, a two-track original master, whether it's a tape media analog or whether it's digital in a file of some kind, which is more and more common, that typically then has been mixed down from the multi-track. And that is kind of the signature. That is how the artist wants the product presented to the audience in terms of the way it sounds and in terms of the balance and the emphasis of different instruments and voices and things of that nature. And so, you know, if you think about it, the multi-track that has the uh, individual instruments or voices, that is really the first gen, that is the origin. Anything coming down from that, you know, is a, is a first generation coming off of that to make that stereo master, for example. Uh, and again, I don't want to get into the whole analog and digital thing, but the point of the matter is, uh, if someone is going to remix something, like Giles Martin has done with some of the Beatles things, okay, if they're going to remix it, they have to go back to the multi-track because they're actually re-emphasizing, de-emphasizing, and placing certain things, uh, as opposed to a remastering, which means they take that stereo definition that was made when it was mixed originally, and they're just going to put it to a new media, and they're going to master it to that, whether it's a CD media or a vinyl media. So they're not remixing it. So that's another area to, to clarify. Obviously, if you have the original tracks, uh, multi-tracks that are there with the individual instruments and voices, you can do a whole lot more calibration. You can do a whole lot more adjustment. And things can sound different. The song can sound totally different. Uh, and back in the day, I think we all have probably heard, if you're a Beatles fan, you know, a lot of the things that they did, you know, they were, they were mixed to mono. They were, that's how they were made. Uh, and that's how the, the, the emphasis was. Stereo was an was a afterthought, uh, actually, at the time. And they didn't really spend much time even mixing those. They threw them together because that really wasn't the emphasis. Now, you know, the, the labels and the, the market uh, in terms of equipment manufacturers were really wanting to sell. Hey, look at this separation. And in some ways, that's probably why some of these things also are so distinct where the voice is over there and the music is over there because it gave you that very hard, distinct stereo kind of imaging. Uh, but it really isn't that um, pleasing to, to listen to. Um, it's better if the voices are toward the middle and the instruments are spread out a little bit. That seems a, a little more natural. But that is all, again, a matter of the engineer and the way that they end up mixing it uh, in, from the multi-channel. And if they mix it down to uh, a mono, then, you know, it's all kind of laid in there together. And it really now is a matter of emphasis, which particular instruments or voices are in fact going to be emphasized or de-emphasized. So that's how really that happens on the front end. And in order to really hear the unique sounds of, of what is recorded, uh, the further back you can get to the multi-track, the more you're going to hear. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because of SACDs uh, and multi-channel. Uh, there is a whole industry of multi-channel, and multi-channel uh, was originated in the 70s, probably the later 60s in terms of uh, benchmark technology, but actually got into the consumer in the 70s. And, and there were records that can do quadraphonic for channel. And uh, there were different methods they had to do that. There was SQ, which was a matrix type of blend uh, of a, a decoder would have to decode that. There was QS, which was a competing one to SQ. Uh, uh, SQ was more like CBS. Uh, Columbia was really pushing that. And then QS were some other labels and a little more independent. Uh, and it actually had a better 
uh, ability than SQ did. And then lastly, there was what was called CD4, which was discrete technology. Um, SQ and QS required decoders. Uh, CD4 required what's called a demodulator. And that was a much more high precision effort in terms of a certain kind of cartridge was needed to get up to the frequency rate to read uh, the carrier signal. And there was uh, also the need for um, what was called, again, this demodulator, which is a little more expensive than decoders. And it would have to pick up that carrier signal and they had adjustments. So it was very... Uh, when it worked, it was great, and when it uh, was able to deliver, it was it was discrete, where you really had really higher separation in the four channels, and that's also called 4.0, which the .0 means no subwoofer, so the lower end was uh, was included in the other channels, whereas newer things have 5.1, which includes a subwoofer channel kind of separately. Uh, but, but the point of this is to talk about the channels and to talk about the mix. So when you listen to a multi-channel, whether it be an older quadraphonic or whether it be the newer SACDs that are in usually 5.1, you really can hear distinct instruments much more easily. And it really does change the experience that you have. Uh, you'll, I mean, you'll literally say, I, boy, I've I hear that piano now. I didn't really hear that really before. And that's usually because when it was in stereo, you know, maybe the volume level on it wasn't that high and other things were predominant over it. So when you have multi-channel, it gets a chance to separate some of those things out. And so uh, it's, it's a very interesting capability. Uh, now, not all SACDs are multi-channel. Be careful. Uh, MoFi's uh, SACDs are just stereo. They're not necessarily multi-channel. Most of them are what are called hybrid, meaning it's an SACD that can play on a CD player. But again, it's still just stereo. It's not multi-channel. So if you want multi-channel, you know, you have to look for that and they're a little more expensive. Um, and you have to have the amplification and the speakers to, to get that reproduction, uh, the amplifier reproducing those those channels, whether it's 4.0 or 5.1, and then of course the speakers to, to pick up on that. But it is a better experience in terms of hearing different things. The mixes are different. I have some quads of uh, uh, Pink Floyd. Uh, there's a, one I think they sell through um, uh, Acoustic Sounds. Uh, that is a, a pressing of that of uh, Dark Side of the Moon. That's 5.1, which is just awesome. Totally uh, hear some really unique things with it. So the idea here was to talk about how does thing get, things get down to where we actually end up hearing them on the media, whether it's a CD or whether it's a, a record. And regardless of the, quote, mastering chain, which really has to do more about refining and, and having the accuracy of that original uh, file or tape, whatever it might be, whatever media is used, uh, the accuracy of that and how well it gets uh, transcribed essentially to the media. But the quality of it and the mix of it and where, it's, where the music is located and the sounds are located is all done up at front in the production and in the mixing uh, that is done by, by the engineer. Uh, and, and you can see if you've ever looked the tools they have now in digital on PC where you can have mixers and any number of channels and obviously the flexibility is so much higher than it was in the past, you know, with the board and everything like that and tapes, which are more difficult to manage. So the, the technology has certainly made it easier to do the work. There, you know, that's not really arguable in my opinion. I don't think anybody can argue that at all. Uh, and I'll be putting a link in here for you to see. Frank Filippetti is an engineer who's been around for several decades, four decades, I think, at least. Uh, and uh, he has a video on uh, his experience moving from analog to digital and what it is it has added to his repertoire to be able uh, to do the work that he does. And it's just, it's just very interesting to, to see. But this, again, is a matter of how does it get to where we get to hear it? So again, it's kind of the imagination of the engineer and then the artists of 
How do they want that end experience to be for you, the listener? What are they wanting you to hear more uh, strikingly or predominantly? Where do they want you to hear it? You know, they can mix it. You know, there's hard, there's hard stereo stuff like in Led Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love, that circular kind of sound back and forth. They go, you know, it, you know, that's for effect, right? That's for effect. The clocks at the beginning of time of Dark Side of the Moon. You know, that's all like if you were standing in a uh, in a shop that had grandfather clocks and they all started going off at the same time, you know, that kind of effect, which is, I actually think, the way they recorded it, if I recall what Alan Parsons had said. So it is, to me, trying to bring what would be live experience to you. What would you hear? How would you hear placement? You know, if all the singers are singing way on one side, you know, that, does that sound like the way they would do it live? Probably not. You know, they'd probably be more centered and maybe the accompanist would be split a little bit further apart from the, the lead singer and, and all these. So you really, you know, music should be almost a close your eyes experience where you could close your eyes and imagine you were either, you know, at, at the concert or in the studio, whatever it might be. Uh, it's one of the reasons live recordings are often mic'd and recorded based on the way the placement is in the hall so that you get that experience over again. But when you're doing it piecemeal or in a studio, uh, you know, you have to kind of reimagine then how you want it done. And I think some of these remixes they call reimagining, you know, a McCartney album or whatever. And the reason is they're, they're looking at maybe some lost tapes and they're looking at bringing those to the product, but also some of the things that were on the original uh, and maybe how they could be mixed differently or done a little differently or outtakes. So, you, you know, that's what it's about. But at the end of the day, records or CDs generally end up in a two channel format. You listen to that, and that is a consequence of how it got mixed. So I hope this was helpful, at least to give you some ideas. I know many of you are audiophiles and you know a lot of this, but there are also people who need sometimes to hear it in layman's terms. I hope some of the pictures I showed are helpful to you to understand the process as well. So as always, I thank you for watching, and if you would subscribe and ring the bell there to get notifications, I'd appreciate it. If you like this video, please click on the thumbs up. And if you have comments, always leave them. I do read them and I'm always uh, trying to reply when something that I think is something you're looking for an answer on. And again, feel free to contact me at email address sound at safe and sound Texas, fully spelled out dot com. That's sound at safe and sound Texas dot com. So for now, I say thanks for watching. And until next time, I'll see you at the sound of Saving Sound, Texas. Take care, everybody.